you grab a Bible and join us this morning? We are in the book of Revelation. Find ourselves in Revelation 15 as we are making our way through this book, week by week, verse by verse, hoping that God is just taking His truth and making it real to you. That's our aim, and so that's why we're asking that you'd have a Bible that hopefully you brought. If you didn't, we've provided chairs around you. Grab one, open it up to Revelation 15 so that you can follow along in our longing is that God would speak to you through His Word. Let's make that a request. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we have opened up Your Word. Now open up our hearts. Make it this morning a time that we get it, that, Lord, we understand Your truth. Lord, may You go further than I can go. Would You set Your Word up strong in our hearts? May it be just that pillar of truth and that solid thing that we hold on to. May it affect our lives, and Lord, would you do that? Would you give us ears to hear from you, each one of us, this morning? In this time, through your word, by your spirit, we're asking for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The wrath of God. When you hear that phrase, I wonder, what is it you think? The wrath of God. In fact, do this with me. Would you think of four words? Four words that come to your mind when you think of the wrath of God. If you're taking notes, you might even just want to write them down at the top right now, just just so you can think about it. There's no, you know, you're not going to be judged on this. We're not going to collect that. This is just for you to kind of think, where are you in this? Because see, here's the deal. We live in such a difficult world. We live in a world that proclaims it's tolerant all the while by being very intolerant. We live in a world whereby, you know, proclaims openness, but it's very, very restricted. We live in a world where opinion is elevated above truth. And it comes to the place that when you come across subjects like this, it's as if our world has moved not into a place of learning, but judging and declaring whether God is good or not. And you hear it all the time. People will say things like, you know, I don't know if it's really fair that God sends people to hell. You know, I'm not sure that I really agree that God drove out the Canaanites in the Old Testament to give the land to Israel. I'm not sure I really understand the, the flood or think that that's right. I, you know, maybe even saying, you know, for my God, well, I don't know if my God's a God of, of judgment. My God's a God of love, people will say. That, 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 you know, God is not an angry God, or others would move into accusations. Why is God so angry? Why does the Old Testament God seem so angry and the New Testament God seem so loving? Hey, these concepts are so constantly assaulted in our world that I know that you're aware of them and more. But the problem is, even if we disagree with that, we still find our own hearts moved where at times we find ourselves wondering confused over the the things like the wrath of God, not knowing even where it is we're supposed to land. But I love that God gives us His truth, and once more, I want to tell you, here as we come into chapter 15, that's the subject, and God is going to give us four words. Four words that in this, you know, section that I just want you to highlight that will highlight what we want to understand this morning. Those four words are finishing, standing, singing, glorying. Hey, that's where we're going to go this morning, and my hope is through those you'll be able to see and understand this, but if I can even give it to you a little bit more as an invitation. I really do believe that God would bring a rescue to this. I think about it this way. Kent Hughes said it this way. Here's what the future can be for you. You can be someone who, instead of being terrified by the justice of God, is thrilled by it. Hey, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to even imagine this for a moment. He says, it could be for you that instead of being terrified when you think about things like the wrath of God, it actually thrills you, that it's inspiring, that it's beautiful, that it's worship-giving, that it's life-giving. I want to tell you that's how God would have us approach it, but it's not where all of us are. So again, as an invitation, it could be for you that the justice of God, the wrath of God, instead of being terrifying, might be thrilling. I want to hold before you this morning that that's exactly what God is going to show us. So let's begin there in verse 1. Would you notice with me how it begins? Revelation 15, verse 1. John writing, he says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, 
great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. Yeah, I try to imagine it right now. John begins this, and he tells us, I saw a sign, a sign, yeah, a picture. That, in many ways, is what God has been doing in this section specifically of the book of Revelation, that God's been painting pictures, if you will, causing truths that we need to understand to be visual, visceral, to be understood. And for John, he sees it. He begins to see the image that's there, and he lets us know right at the beginning, it is great. It's a marvelous thing that there's some sense that's just altogether important. It's not a little sidelight issue. It's not like, hey, I happened to notice something over. No, it's like, this was huge. This is, this is something that was impressive, awe-inspiring, amazing. That there ought to be a sense that right now what he's telling us that God is going to hold before us could be that to us. Well, what is it John saw? Well, try to imagine it. Verse 1 again, then I saw another sign. And heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them, the wrath of God is complete. John looks and he sees seven angels. Seven angels, and in them, they have the seven last plagues. Now, as we gaze on this, understand this, in many ways what John does for us here, what God does for us is he gives us an introductory chapter into these final things. If you've been with us so far in the book of Revelation, you know we've seen Satan in Revelation 12 and 13. We saw his big play that's going to be at work in the great tribulation. Then in chapter 14, we had a moment of hope. It was just like an oasis of saying, hey, just a reminder, God is going to be doing good in there. There's going to be a salvation. There's going to be some amazing things. But now, starting in chapter 15, we're looking on these final things, what he calls the seven last plagues. And really here, he introduces what's going to take place in chapter 16 through 19. In chapter 16, we're going to see seven bowls of God's wrath that these angels pour out. But in those bowls, they contain even what's next. Part of it's going to be the judgment on Babylon, which will be chapters you know, 17 and 18. Part of it's going to be the paving the way for Armageddon, which is in chapter 19. And so all of that's kind of here contained that these seven plagues, they, they encompass these final big things that God is pouring out. And so he's inviting us to see them. He's inviting us to understand them. And he tells us if you see them, then here's what you see. You see God's wrath complete. You see God's wrath just, just, just finished and at work in mankind. Now let's pause there for a moment because this is really important and it's a far larger subject than I can even begin to just tackle with you this morning. But at the same point, I do want to express just a couple pieces of it. The wrath of God, we know what it is. Paul would say it to us this way in Romans. In Romans 1 verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God's wrath. It's shown to us. We get a chance to see what it is. What is God's wrath? It's His response to sin. God's wrath is not something like deep-seated in God that needs expression. It's not like, you know, he's just, you know, waiting to get out. He says, no, this is God's wrath, and it's how he's de responding to man's sin. This is God's wrath revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That it's sin that is drawing this out. It is sin that causes God to respond this way. Now, we talked about this last week. In fact, if you were with us, we ended there in chapter 14, and there was this vision that John had of just a... a angel that stood and gathered in these grapes from the whole earth. And we talked about then that that was a picture of sin, that you almost could imagine sin like this harvest that hasn't been brought in yet, or this debt that's outstanding against mankind. And as God gathers all that together, he throws it into the wine press of the wrath of God, and it comes out like a flood. But the key issue there, again, is this is God's response to sin. Now, it's not a unique response or one that's not always there. In fact, Psalm 7 tells it to us this way. God is a just judge, and He is angry with the wicked every day. 
I mean, it's not like we, you know, God's wrath doesn't exist. It exists today. It is always His response to sin. It is always how He feels about sin. It is always the way He sees it, and He sees it that way everywhere today. But God's wrath is not fully in motion yet. God is withholding, restraining that for a period of time. It gives it to us this way in Romans 3. Sorry, Romans 2, verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He looks at this rebellious mankind and says, it's as if you're storing up this wrath. Every time you sin, every, all your sins, they are like this massive backlog of stuff that's going to come pouring out on you in the day of judgment. It's restrained, but it's present in every sin. So God's wrath, it's real. It's a, a response of God to sin. But maybe the key thought for us here this morning in this single word, this idea of finishing, is that's going to come fully into play. That the idea is it's going to be fully expressed, that this is no vain threat. The word that's used here for complete, the wrath of God being complete, some of you will recognize it. You might remember for you who know your Bibles there in in the cross, the last words of Jesus was, it is finished. The Greek word there is tetelestai, and it has this incredible work of it being entirely accomplished. The root of that word, tetelo, it's used here. That's this. And it has the idea of it just being complete, of it being done, of it being completed and and fully in motion. Why do you need to know this? The wrath of God is not a, a vain threat from God. Now, you probably understand that, but let's compare it. We do it all the time. We make threats that we have no intention of keeping or even any possibility of ever enacting, right? I mean, parents, I mean, you guys understand, right? You ever made one of those threats? Like, you better stop that, or I'm going to ground you for the rest of your life. Like, really? Like, really? really? I mean, is that, that's not even possible. I mean, you just made a threat that there's no way you're ever going to be able to, fo- I mean, you don't mean it. I mean, you're just, you're just saying something, and, and we do that. We make threats that we have no intention of keeping. We make, there are things that we worry that'll happen that'll never happen, but not so the wrath of God. It's coming, and it's going to be completed. It's not just a a threat. It's going to fully be set into motion, that he's telling us there's a day coming when God's wrath that has been held back, that has been restrained, is going to pour out in its entirety. Not any part of it held back, not any part of it watered down. God's wrath in its completeness poured upon us. We need to know that that's coming. Paul would say it to us this way in Ephesians, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. He looked at sin and all that's going to happen. He says, don't let anybody tell you it's not coming. Don't let anybody deceive you with words like, well, I don't really think God's going to do that. You know, I don't really think that there's really, I mean, I just don't think that God would, my God wouldn't really do that. Those are lies. Those are vain words. Don't let anybody deceive you because God's wrath is fully coming. So we begin there that when he's telling us here in Revelation 15, he's seeing it as an image. He says the wrath of God is going to be finished. It is going to be completed. It's going to come fully into expression in our world. Wow. Well, as that just kind of lays upon your heart there, what do we do with that? Well, keep reading. Verse 2 says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. As you imagine this right now, this picture that we want to highlight in that word stand, maybe you saw it, maybe you imagined it, but I want you to do it again. I'm going to read the verse again. You can follow if you want, but I just want you in the clearest Uh, of your imagination, try to picture what John is seeing. It says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. We gaze into this, and he lets us know right now at the very beginning of it, he sees something. He says it's something that's kind of like 
a sea of glass mingled with fire. What is this? Can I just pause and say it's absolutely amazing. One of the things I love about the book of Revelation is it really is a book that draws together themes that have been flowing throughout the whole Bible. But therein also lies parts of its problems. If you are not someone who's really conversant yet in the scriptures, if you're not someone who's read the whole Bible or continues to read the whole thing, some of these things are just going to be a little bit more shallow to you. And I don't mean that in any kind of accusation. I'm just telling you the book of Revelation is a capstone that it pulls together things that you'll never understand unless you see it through the lens of the rest of the Bible. So again, I'm just letting you know that, and in that, there's a huge thing that is pictured here. What, where, where he's looking, he's in the temple, he's in the tabernacle of God, he's in God's presence, and in the Old Testament, you have the temple or the tabernacle that would be a part of it. And if you're familiar with some of that, I just want to speak to you who are. We talked about this a little bit in Revelation 4 if you wanted to go back to it, but you might remember that there was in the temple something that they called the Bronze Sea. The Bronze Sea. Yeah, here's how it worked. If you were to be making your way into God's presence, you would have to deal with your sin at the Bronze Altar. That was the place of sacrifice. That was the place that is fulfilled in Christ, that Christ is our sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. But then you come to this bronze sea that was a place of washing, and the idea was every time somebody went past this, every time you were moving back and forth in temple, every time you stopped, every time, just to wash yourself and be clean, because even though the price has been paid, there was a sense, boy, we just got to be clean. (laughs) We just got to be clean. We're in God's presence. We just got to be clean. And if you know that picture, it's an amazing picture because it's something we're called to in Christ, to continually deal with sin, that we're always doing that. In fact, again, for you guys who are familiar with this, one of the amazing things about the Bronze Sea in the Old Testament is it has no dimensions. It's the only part in the tabernacle that has absolutely no dimensions because there is a sense of saying, this is unlimited. God's grace is amazing. But if you're tracking, even just a little bit, when we get into heaven and we begin to see what this fullness looks like there, instead of finding a place where we're going to wash and continual washing. Instead, we find this place, the sea of glass, that pictures for us a place where we're forgiven, and there's no more need to wash. There's no more place. Now, this is absolutely amazing. I just got to tell you, this is like really, really huge, and I wish I could develop it more. I wish I could just take you through all the images throughout the Scripture, but I can just tell you, this is amazing. If you were trying to live the Christian life out, you are struggling with this all the time. It would seem like every day, you are, God, please forgive me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought something wrong. I got arrogant. I was proud. I, I was judgmental. I mean, you just always, wash me, wash me, wash me. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I mean, it's just, it has to be a constant place in your life because you're always dealing with it. So it is on this place. But in heaven, it's no more washing. It's like a sea of glass. It's like a display case that's showing off God's good work in our life, no longer needing to be clean because we are clean. Because there we are, so when you see it in heaven, there's this sea of glass, and I think that's amazing. It's pictured here, again, it's also pictured in Revelation 4. But here John adds to it. It's not just a sea of glass, it's as if it's mingled with fire. The theme in this chapter is the judgment of God, God's wrath being poured out on mankind, but what's being pictured here is this fire kind of moves in here, and here's this group of people. What are they doing in light of this? Well, they have victory. They have victory. Over what? Well, it tells us. Go back and notice it again. Verse 2, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, standing over, and, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Yeah, who is this that has this victory over the Antichrist, which is the beast, the number of his name, over, over his image? Well, these are what we would call tribulation believers. Now, that's incredibly hopeful. Again, it's a good reminder, because we saw this back in Revelation 12 and 13, that Satan is going to make his big play. There's going to become a time where the mark of the beast is present, where he's going to cause the whole world to worship him, and the whole world is. But there will be exceptions. There will be people that believe in Jesus. And this is one of those reminders. These are those. They're there. They're standing, you know, on this no longer, in that sense, just under that. Now, that's important, and that's incredibly hopeful. 
but have this understanding in that picture. It's not just them. It really becomes a picture of all believers because where they stand is where we stand. We are those who have the victory. We are those that, that know that. Paul would say it to us this way in Romans 8. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That when you think about all the things we go through, we are more than conquerors, more than victors is actually the way it would say it, using the same word that's used here. We are victorious and we are more than victorious. We are those who have this because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, there is a, a sense that we become overcomers. We become those who have this victory, and that's where these are. And if you can see that, both tribulation believers and us, then what you need to see is they are standing. They are standing. They are standing on the sea of glass. What you need to see them is standing over God's wrath. When we think about God's wrath, this is those who are standing, and I just want to tell you how incredibly hopeful this is. Here's the sad thing. When we think about the wrath of God, the sad reality is there are so many people who should not be afraid of the wrath of God and are. And there are so many people who are not afraid of the wrath of God, and they should be. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that you have come to faith in God through the sacrifice of Christ, that you've believed on Him, that you know Him, that you're actively walking with Him, can I just tell you something? You should not be somebody who is afraid of the wrath of God. Because where these are, you are. You stand in God's presence. You stand over this. Paul would say it to us this way in 1 Thessalonians 5. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a believer, we're not appointed to that. The wrath of God, that's not for us. We've been rescued. We've been rescued by Jesus Christ. We've been rescued by the blood of the Lamb. We've been rescued by that. He said to us this way in Romans 5, much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. If we are made right with Jesus by the blood of Christ, the wrath of God is not for us. That is totally gone. Jesus has rescued us from that. In fact, I like the description at the beginning of 1 Thessalonians when Paul is writing to him, and he describes those who are believers as saying, those who wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's what he does. I mean, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. There's something about understanding this. There's something about seeing this that if we could see it, instead of causing us to be afraid, it causes us to exult in Christ and recognize that He is amazing. I'm just telling you right now, again, I know this is true. For some of you, the wrath of God scares you, and it shouldn't. Instead of it, when you see the wrath of God, you should be amazed at your Savior. Like, He rescued me from that. I, when I think about the wrath of God, I'm standing. I'm standing in God's presence. I'm standing on the sea. I'm standing over that judgment. It's no longer what I am because of Christ who's done this for me. No, you need to see that. And there ought to be a place that when you do that, that you, you know, don't diminish the wrath of God, but you recognize the greatness of the sacrifice of Christ that, who has rescued us. I'm going to tell you, there's a beautiful picture there. There's an amazing place that if you can see it, it's altogether meant to be there, but it rises even one more step. Because not only are these standing, they're actually singing. Well, let's go back. We actually began to see it there at the end of verse 2. Would you notice at the end of verse 2 where it says that these are standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses and the, so the, servant, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Pause. Here's these are. He says when he sees this, there's this group of people and they're standing they are standing in God's presence. They are standing over the judgment that's there. And they're standing on that sea. And they have harps, literally harps of God, harps that belong to God. And they sing. As a quick little aside, this is one of the places where that image comes. If you ever, you know, kind of people picture heaven and think, well, you know, when you get to heaven, you're just going to be on a cloud with your little harp and you're just going to sing songs. Can I just tell you something? Heaven is richer than that. It is better than that. It is going to be more fun, more joyful. In his presence is fullness of joy. And you have so much more. The God who created us to exist has beautiful things for us in eternity. It's not going to be just a, a monotone singing there with a harp. 
That being said, we are going to sing. And there's a sense that that's how he sees here. These harps are brought out. And don't picture one of those um, kind of melodious or, you know, kind of, you know, almost uh, aristocratic kind of, you know, places that you look at a harp. That's not what this is. The harp that was used here really is the biblical harp that quite honestly played and sounded a lot more like a guitar. I mean, it really was that, that this, this, this lyre that would be a picture of that. And so it's a musical thing. It's something that's a celebratory thing. And they are singing. They are singing. Well, what are they singing? Well, it told us. It told us there in verse 3, they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for, you, for your judgments have been manifested, made clear. Wow. So they sing. They sing a song. Interesting enough, it gives us a description. It's the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's been clear all the way through the book of Revelation. But here's the question. What does he mean by that? Well, there's a lot of depth there. I can't give you all of it. It's probably much further than I've gone, but I can just draw your attention to a couple of things. The Song of Moses, the Song of the Lamb, what is it? Well, the Song of Moses, it's the first song recorded in the Bible. The Song of the Lamb is the last song recorded in the Bible. The Song of uh, Moses is actually found in Exodus 15. It's right after the opening of the Red Sea, the children of Israel come out, Moses gives a song to the women, they sing this incredible song, the last song recorded, just kind of there in Revelation 5, and in one sense, because it's the first and the last, it becomes kind of the bookends, including everything else in between. It's the song. It's the song that flows from first to last. Now, that said, the words that are found in Exodus 15 and Revelation 5 are not the words that are found here. So how is it a song of the Moses and a song of the Lamb? Well, in some ways, it's the themes of that. So here's a little bit of homework. We're not going to do it right now, but you might want to later today just go and read those chapters. Go and read all of Exodus 15. Go and read Revelation 5. In fact, you might want to even just add a bonus in there. There are some Bible students that wonder if it's not Exodus 15, that it might be Deuteronomy 32, because that's also called the Song of Moses. Read that too. Read those three chapters. There's Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 32, Revelation 5, and and just get this feel of this worship, this worshipful response to who God is and what He's done. And that'll help you kind of move into this, but then again to say, well, it's more than that. Well, it's obviously not just the first and last song. In one sense, the song of Moses is this song that flows throughout the Old Testament, right? That's even how the Bible's seen. Sometimes for the Jews, they will call the Old Testament the book of Moses or the books of Moses. The Lamb, it's the Christ, and He's the, obviously the central and most, just the picture of the New Testament. And right here, it just does this incredible thing that answers even the lie that permeates into our world today. Because you've heard it, right? Well, the God in the Old Testament, he's so mean. God of the New Testament, he's so loving. And I have one of those simple responses when people say that. It's like, I don't think you've read either one. You know, because there, you know, if you read, the God of the, you read the Old Testament, I'll show you a God of mercy and grace. And you should read the New Testament, I will also show you a God of judgment. It is both of it. In fact, it's all of it together. To, to say it's the song of, the old, uh, of Moses and the song of the Lamb, it's this idea that it's a fully just encompassing picture, accompanying all that God is, that we are talking about the law, which is the books of Moses, the law of Moses, the Bible would say, that shows us our sin. But we're also talking about the grace that's given to us in Christ. We're talking about the judgment that comes because of our sin. But we're talking about the salvation that comes to us in Christ. And yet we're not just focusing on one aspect of it. It's the idea of the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb grasps the full breadth of this. So it's both of it. Maybe that makes sense, but I'll just tell you, it is one of the downfalls. In any generation, we have a a way of overemphasizing certain aspects of who God is. And if I had to give you my opinion, I would tell you that we are a generation that has probably overemphasized the love of God. 
if that's really possible. I mean, the love of God, God is love. I mean, he is an amazing God, and, and love is a part of that, but sometimes it's held to that and encounter just place to God's truth and his justice and his ways. But this song encompasses both. It's a song that is fully just embracing the entire work of God, the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. Okay, that's at least somewhat helpful. There's more there that you might want to dive into. What else do we have? Well, we read through it a moment ago, and I, I read the words, and I just want to tell you it's really fun. There's some neat, just poetic, just movings back and forth for some of you who understand the way songs work. There's just a, a neat kind of structure to this whole song, but I want to approach it a little bit more simply. There are really two themes to this song. One of them is to sing of what God is doing, His ways, specifically in the wrath of God. The other is to sing of God's character, to sing of who He is. I just want you to think about those and notice that. So here's what I want to do. I just want to put the song that's recorded here up on the screen and then just kind of walk you through it. So in one sense, it is a celebration or a singing to God about what He's doing. It begins by just telling us at the beginning of the song, great and marvelous are your works. It's a way of saying, God, what you're doing is amazing. God, your ways, your works, they're marvelous. They're, they're, they're wonderful. Not only are they wonderful, he says, just and true are your ways. God, what you're doing, it's fair. You are just. You are just, and what you are doing is true. God, this is who you are, and, and, and just acknowledging it. And as he tells us this, he lets us know, actually, the whole world's going to acknowledge this. For he ends the song saying, all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Hey, the Bible's really clear. We're going to see this happen. As we move into Revelation 19 and then into chapter 20, we're going to see the great white throne judgment of God. God's going to pull all of humanity before him, and they're going to be judged. And on that day, they're going to see, and they're going to worship him. Not in a way of acknowledging Jesus as their Savior. They're not going to get saved on that day. But they are going to acknowledge he's God, and he's right. Hear me clearly. Nobody who's going to face the wrath of God in that day is going to proclaim that God is unfair. Oh, this is so unfair. I don't deserve this. I mean, God, God is not, not, he's not being fair to me. That's how people sound today. It's not how they're going to sound then. On that day when God's judgment is manifested, the world is going to notice it. All the nations, all the people are going to come and say, God, you know what? Your judgments are right. They are just and they are true. This might be a helpful thing even just to communicate this just one step further. We do struggle with it. I mean, if we're all together honest, some of us more than others, we try to figure it out. And we, we're trying to think, okay, I, I mean, sometimes I know that God is good, but I watch how it happens and I can find it confusing. I can, I can have so many questions. And that's really where we are. But I want to draw your attention again. This is a song sung when God's wrath is fully poured out by tribulation believers, and then us included, who see it clearly, and they see it from that side of things, and they're telling us, God is good. He is just. Boy, what he's doing is true. There's something helpful there. There's a poem I heard years ago that kind of helped it kind of work in my life, and interestingly enough, it comes out of my prayers every now and then. I've done a little bit of research on it, can't find out who wrote the poem. It's quoted through a number of works, but it's always left unattributed, but I just like it. Here's the poem. It simply says it this way. He writes in characters too grand for our short sight to understand. We catch but broken strokes and try to fathom all the mystery of withered hopes, of death, of life, the endless war, the useless strife. But there, with larger, clearer sight, we shall see this. His way was right. I just like that. I just really like that. There, with larger and clearer sight, you know what we'll say? God, you are right. You are just. You are true. God, you have, what you have done, man, it is absolutely right. It is absolutely good. It is absolutely there. And that's what they're telling us we can sing. There's something about looking on the judgment of God that we would say, okay, it is that. And I'm able to celebrate that what God is doing is just and true. And yet what he's doing is connected to who he is. So the song focuses not just on what God is doing, but who he is. So again, it kind of moves in this bouncing back wonderful way where it begins by saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, God 
Almighty. You're God. You're the Lord. And you're all powerful. You're mighty. There's just nothing you cannot do. There's just a sense of just acknowledging who he is, of just saying, this is God, this is, this is who you are, and you're the king. You're the king of the saints. Technical note, king of the saints. Some of your translations will say king of the nations, and it's an interesting textual struggle because the truth is, uh, in, in our text that we have, the, the handwritten text that came back from the early generations, it's about split 50-50. It really is like, it could go one way or the other. It's either king of the saints, or it's the king of the nations, or even the king of the world. But I'm kind of a simple guy, so if you'll just allow me just to just bounce back with you and say, yes. He's the king. He's the king of what? Everything. I mean, he's the king of his saints. Yep, he's the king of the world. He's the one who's on his throne. He's the one who's in charge. He's, he's reigning. He's ruling. He's sovereign. The point of it, he's the king. And that's what they're singing. In fact, they're going to sing this song, and they say, who shall not fear you and glorify your name? Because you're the only one who's holy. It says, if you really see this, you would go, God, you're amazing. And you are the only one. You are the only one who is holy. He is. Nobody else is. Nobody else is holy. Nobody else is perfect, but our God is perfect. In an imperfect world, sometimes that is so helpful just to understand. Our God is a holy God. That's what they're singing. They're singing this song that looks on this, that acknowledges that who God is and also acknowledges what He does, but can I just draw your attention so that you don't miss it? They're singing in response to the wrath of God. They see this and it inspires them to song. And that's helpful. Maybe even an invitation. See, here's the thing. For us, for some of us, the wrath of God, we, we might accept it, but boy, it doesn't move us to sing. I mean, there are other things that move us to sing. I mean, maybe again, the love of God, we can do that. Lots of times, you know, we think about how much God loves us, and He does. God is love. And those become songs but when have we looked on the justice of God and said, man, I just feel like singing. I just feel like singing. I just feel like singing because my God is a good God. My God is a holy God. My God is a righteous God. I just want to tell you, if that's not where you are, it is where you can be, and it is where you will be. That when we see this from the other side, it's, it's going to be awe-inspiring, the kind of thing that just moves us to, yes, God, you're amazing. God, you're good. God, you're glorious. God, you're right. You're, I mean, this is, it, it should, the wrath of God should be something that just moves us into that. It certainly can be. In fact, it is there that kind of moves us to that last word. Oh, yeah, we're going to look at God's wrath. It's going to be fully finished. It's gonna, we're going to be those who stand and sing. And yet, as he says all of this, there is an idea of just recognizing God's glory. So do this. I'm going to read it again. Try to imagine this section. Do your best to picture it. Verse 5, after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the to the seven angels, seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Wow. So as you're gazing on this, a number of things appear. The first thing is where this is coming out of. He says, you know, he looked, and, and this is, behold, the, ta the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Or maybe even better said, the sanctuary of the tabernacle, the temple or the tabernacle in heaven was opened. What's that? Well, once more, I wish I had lots of time. Wish we could go through and talk about the temple and the tabernacle, but I'll just remind you this. That was the most holy place ever. The, the holy of holies, the sanctuary where God's presence resides, the best, most beautiful, most glorious place in all eternity. That's where this is coming from. It's as if it's flowing out of that. Again, this is not some extraneous thing. 
to who God is. It's flowing right out of the glory of his presence, right out of the holy of holies. And as you gaze on that, imagine seeing these seven angels. He says he looks and he sees these seven angels. It tells us in verse 6, out of the temple came seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure, bright linen. Can you picture it? There they are. It's beautiful. It's bright. It's, it, it's glistening in its beauty and its purity and its holiness. They're in this bright linen. These are not like, you know, ugly beings. This isn't an ugly picture. It's a beautiful picture. It says around them they have these, they have these chests girded with golden bands. This picture of, of, of just God's presence of holiness. That you look upon this, which is interesting because even back in Revelation 1, we saw that Jesus was clothed in this golden band. And, and there's something beautiful in this picture of who God is and, and His ways. Then we see more angels, presence angels or seraphim, called the four living creatures. Verse 7 says, Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So here they come, and here comes the wrath of God where it's all complete, and yet just picture it, if you will, these beautiful angels glistening in white, golden bands, and golden bowls. Metal is significant. Pictures are powerful all the way through Revelation, all through the Bible. If you're familiar, again, with the Old Testament, then you might just have this even better. If you were to go back to the tabernacle or the temple, you would discover any piece of metal that was dealing with sin, that was to pay for sin or to deal with sin, it would be bronze or brass. It was always that because it pictured where sin was atoned for. Pieces that were about worship, they were silver. But anything that had to do with God's presence itself was gold. Gold was this picture of God, of His glory, of the most beautiful, of the most holy, of the most amazing. And that's what this is. These angels, they're they're just banded with gold. They have these golden bowls. And then he just pictures the very glory of God. I mean, he just helps us to try to imagine it, to see this whole thing as he tells us in verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. I mean, there you are watching. It's as if this just smoke just fills this temple. But it's, it's special. It's the smoke that comes out of God's glory. I mean, God's beauty, I mean, just how amazing He is, His power, so glorious, so powerful is it that it's unapproachable. Nobody. Nobody can even enter into that in the midst of that. This is one of those pictures that's found, again, a number of places in the Bible, sometimes it's called the Shekinah glory. That word's never used in the Bible, but it literally means presence, and it speaks of this time when God's presence is just so powerful so poignant that it just drives out everything else. That's actually what happened when the original tabernacle was built. Moses was given the instructions, they put it all together, and then God inaugurates it in Exodus 40. It says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It was a moment, it was like God is here. <laughs> I mean, God is here and His glory is so re- I mean, nobody could even enter into it because it was so beautiful, so glorious, so powerful. That becomes that picture of the Shekinah glory. Well, this is really, really important, so just think this through for a moment. Why do you need to see this here? Specifically connecting to the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God flows out of God's holiness. It is God's holiness on display. It is beautiful. It is not ugly. It is glorious. It is not to be, you know, just hidden or, or ignored. It is something that God says it's, it's absolutely glorious. But see, here's our problem. When we think about wrath, we think about anger, we just don't see it anywhere else. Why? Because nobody else is holy but God. You have never, ever seen anybody else handle it right when we think about wrath, what we think about are pictures and images of people who go too far. 
you know, the kind of thing where their head explodes and steam comes out of their ears, you know, and turning green, I mean, whatever, it's just like, yeah, and you, and you think, well, they, get, they got mad, that's what happened, you know, they just, watch out, you know, they just exploded in anger, and it just, it's some kind of over, you know, just overexertion or overexpression or unfair, and, and you're just like, that's wrath, that's what it looks like. I just want to tell you, that's not God's wrath. That's not God. He is not angry and responding out of his character. He's not out of bounds. He's not in any way doing this. Think about it this way. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, said it this way, God's wrath in the Bible is never the capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to moral evil. God's wrath, it's never irritable. God's not just having a bad day and just decides all of a sudden to express himself. No, it's holy. He is responding to sin absolutely right. He's absolutely beautiful, and it's absolutely glorious. There is a sense that if you could see that, that's who he is. That's what he's doing. And I'm just going to tell you right now, it's maybe one of the reasons you're afraid or don't understand the wrath of God. When you think about the wrath of God, for you it is this, oh, that's just like, okay, that's not, that's not my, does that look like my God? I don't know. I mean, he looks like he's angry. No, that's holiness. It's beautiful. It's something that if you could see it, you would be like, wow, that's my God. He's holy. He's good. He's just. He's fair. I mean, if you could see it that way, he would invite you to see that. And I'm just telling you, that's what he's holding before you here. He's telling us, he's giving us this view so that chapter 15 kind of comes and just says, is this the way you're viewing it? Hey, just be honest. I mean, I asked you at the beginning this morning, I said, you know, just write down four words. Think of four words that you think about the wrath of God. And, you know, I'm not saying you got it wrong. Maybe you saw it in some other ways, but I'm just curious if for some of you, if you came even close to what God was describing here. I wonder if when you think about the wrath of God, if you think, oh, it is coming. It is coming. It's going to be finished, but for me, I'm standing. I don't, that's not mine. <laughs> Jesus rescued me from the wrath of God, and I am singing. I am so, so glad for who my God is. I'm rejoicing in who He is, because my God is glorious. His wrath is His holiness. It's beautiful because my God is beautiful. And when He deals with this, it's not going to be an ugly thing. It's a beautiful, it's a right thing. It's what sin has done. And our God is responding to it. See, so often it, we're just, it's just out of focus in our life. Have you done that? Have you ever had to go to like the eye doctor? You, you know what I mean by that? Just kind of changing the analogy. You go into the eye doctor and you, maybe they put one of those eye charts up in front of you and they tell you what's there and you're kind of looking at it and you're like, ah. Uh, that's not what I see. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just, I don't see that. Well, here's what I want you to understand. If you are in the right moment, you recognize the problem wasn't the chart. The problem is your eyes. I mean, it's right. I know that it's actually there. I just can't see it. I feel like it's out of focus. I feel like it's a little blurry right now. I'm just wondering if maybe you could have such an honest admission before God. If you see God's wrath and it's out of focus to you, if what God describes here isn't like, oh, I see that. That's ex- when, I, when I look at it, I see God's wrath, and I see it being finished, and I see us standing, and I see us singing, and I see God's glory. If that's not what you see, I'm just wondering if you could be honest and say, God, <laughs> uh, no, not what I'm seeing right now. I, I, I recognize this. The problem isn't with God's wrath. I'm the problem. You know, my focus is out. And for whatever that is, just to come and say, okay, God, if I'm out, just would you help me to see it? Would you bring in clarity? Would you bring me to see a little bit better what I'm certainly going to see then? I just want to tell you that's possible. And it's possible. And I think that's a little bit to why this chapter has there. So with that in mind, let's do this. Let's, let me share one more thing. I think about what it told us at the end of John 3, and we talked about it last week where he says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He says, here's the amazing thing. If you believe in Jesus, then you have life. You know how much life? Everlasting life. You're going to enjoy God's just eternal joy. Eternal wrath is not for you. You're going to live forever with him. It's going to be amazing. It is better than you've ever imagined. 
But if you don't know God right now, God's wrath abides on you. It's not fully expressed right now, but it is hovering over you. It is yours. It's deserved, and it's coming. But the scary thing is those who shouldn't be afraid of the wrath of God are. And those who should, not, who should be afraid of the wrath of God are not. And I'm just telling you, if you don't know Jesus today, if you haven't believed upon him and are saved, you should be afraid. The wrath of God abides on you. And it's, and it's coming. It's going to be expressed. God is not threatening what he's not going to do. He's going to do it. And today's a day for us just to do that. So you can close your Bibles, notebooks, and here's what we want to do. We want to just say this as we respond to the wrath of God today. We want to begin by saying, maybe it's you here today that you don't know Jesus. You're not a Christian. You're, you're somehow outside of that. We're glad you're here, but we also just want to be honest with you. You just need to understand where you are. In the words of John the Baptist, you need to flee from the wrath to come. You should run away from this because it is coming. It is coming. And we long for you to do that. So here's what we want to do. The way we, that we've been doing that on Sunday mornings is we're just going to give a moment to pray. It's a quiet moment. It's a moment that we're just going to give you space that if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that you can just ask for him to save you. And you desperately need him to save you. There's no magic words to do that. There's no magic way to do that. We just want to give you space that before you leave here, you can just ask that God would rescue you. As we give you that opportunity and give you space to pray, for those of us who know Jesus, we're going to pray for our own hearts in a moment, but we want to take this moment, and we're just going to join in just praying for those that don't know Jesus, that don't have a relationship. So let's take this quiet moment right now and just ask. And again, if that's you that needs to surrender to Jesus, do so now, please. If it's you that knows Jesus, let's pray for those that don't know Jesus right now. Jesus, I thank you that you save us from the wrath to come. And I'm praying right now for these here that don't know you, who are in this room, who are watching online right now, and their present state is so scary to me. The wrath of God, it abides on them. It hovers over them at any moment, ready just to break out and, and bring down the weight of destruction upon them. Their sin, it's deserved. It's right, and yet, Lord, I'm afraid for them, and I know there's hope. I know that today you are a God that saves. So save these. Soften their hearts. Enable them to believe and to, and to come to true repentance in you. God, I thank you that you're a God that does that, that day by day you're drawing people to yourself. So today we pray that you would rescue these from the wrath of God. We ask for that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If that's you, we're just inviting you to surrender your life to Christ again today. But for the rest of you, that, that you really, you're a believer perhaps, you really do know Him, it might be this morning again that you just find yourself out of balance. <laughs> I mean, just not seeing God's wrath clearly. And if you could just admit that and, and even ask that God would take these four words that we've seen this morning and just imprint them on your heart so that your response to the wrath of God, it's a good response. It's a place you go, that's, that's my God. He is glorious, He is good, He is faithful, He is true. That you'd be able to recognize it and see that. So quietly between you and the Lord, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk to Him about that. I'm going to do the same, and then we'll close together in worship in just a moment.
Jesus, to think about the man that you healed, the blind man who came to you, and you anointed him and touched him, and, 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 he, and he saw, and you asked him what he saw. And he said, I, I, I see men like trees walking. It was amazing. He, he, he could see what he couldn't see before, but it still was so blurry and so out of focus. And you touched him again. You healed him so that not only could he see, but he could see rightly and clearly. God, I'm asking for that. I thank you for many here this morning that we were blind and now we see. Thank you that you've rescued amazing grace. But for some of us, we just still admit, maybe all of us, we admit, God, I see men like trees walking. I just don't see this clearly. Would you touch us with your truth, with your grace? Would you help us to be those that see the wrath of God as something that you are fully going to accomplish, something that we stand over and, and, and just in victory in, that we would be just worshiping you for who you are and recognizing that you are glorious and holy. Lord, I pray for that for me and for all of us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So longing that God meets you in that and draws you to that. If you have questions, if we have left you with some and you want someone to pray with, Pastor Phil will be up here at front. We can find some others. We would love just to connect with you and pray with you. But right now, we just want to commit you into God's presence and hands. So would you stand with us? We're going to close worshiping God, just declaring and recognizing His holiness and His goodness, longing that He meets us in that, longing that God would even just draw you to Him. And with that, I bless you in His name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.